these are just two little ways of schematizing the fundamental structure that Hegel's looking at. to do, and, and I'll meet you, uh, I'm going to go leap right into the chapter and then come back to some of the stuff on action we were talking about at the end last week, but I'm bound to forget to talk about action, so please remind me uh, to do it, uh, uh, but I just didn't want to delay getting into the chapter itself, and uh, for me, this is the highlight, in a way, of the book. When I first read Hegel as part of a crazy reading group in Edinburgh, uh, of course I was gripped by the master-slave dialectic and reading Perry Jenner. But the moment of reading this chapter, the moment when suddenly, in the middle of a philosophy text, all about conceptuality and dialectic, suddenly this woman appears. I just had prickles on the back of my neck. Uh, it just meant that somehow philosophy was different than I ever imagined it could be. That somehow a philosophy text to think about the meaning of being in general should have to think about antigone. Have to think about antigone. Struck me as extraordinary and still does. And that all other philosophies I know of, none of them reach this level of concreteness. This level of, of letting an individual and an individual, so it turns out a fictional individual, have this role, but Hegel just takes her as if she is this individual who is central for thinking about the meaning of the fundamental categories necessary for self-understanding for us Westerners. He just plainly thinks that, and I'm going to actually suggest that the chapter on spirit is about her, and therefore that, in a way, the book is about her. Vindicating Antigone could have been the title of the book, or my reading of it. So a few promissory notes. Nothing I said to move up to that, but start with So the chapter uh, on ethical life, on the Greeks, is divided into two parts. The chapter as a whole is divided into three parts, two parts on Greece, one part on Rome. Rome solves all the problems that didn't get solved in Greece. Don't forget about Rome. The ethical order, the first part, is an attempt to display Greek life through the way in which it was romanticized by German philosophy. It's not a historical account, but it's the account of Germany necessary for our historical retrospection. It's the way in which Greek ethical life enters into our Western self-consciousness. 
and it is an image of the Greek world as utterly harmonious and unified society. That's what I was trying to schematize here a bit. Right? I'll say more about that. It is finally, Hegel is going to complain, an aesthetic description and untrue. Well, what was it about the Greek world that made a claim to something that could be called post-Kantian? And the answer, we've already seen last week, week before even, is that it is a movement into the sociality of reason. The sociality of reason, reason has worked out, uh, I need so many different things by that phrase, in part it means the rationality of our everyday life worked out by the structure of our fundamental institutions and the nature of our self-conception as it is derived from our participation in those institutions and our understanding of ourselves as such participants. So the sociality of reason is the rationality implicit in our practices and that we have no access to our self-understanding independently of those practices and the way in which they structure a totality. That that need not be explicit, and in fact, it almost never is. Um, That's part of Hegel's story. I'll mention it, and, and then you can just worry about it. Hegel thinks that art, what we think of as art, did not become art until there was no longer art. That is, art only emerges after it's eclipsed by philosophy as authoritative. So the meaning of the being of a practice is known only retrospectively. Right? It was opaque in its practice. That would be a core song. Although there is a new translation of a book out that deals with that thought itself very nicely, called The End of Art by Eva Goylin, uh, which talks about Hegel and Nietzsche and Adorno. Who else? Danto. Hmm? Danto. And Danto, yes. <laughs> that renegade Hegelian in Columbia, yeah. So, the sociality of reason uh, is what makes it, in the sense I've just indicated, uh, post-Kantian, and that that sociality appears as an aesthetic image. The ethical realm, Hegel says in paragraph 463, is in this way an enduring existence, an immaculate world, a world unsullied by any internal dissension. Now, that's not Hegel's own voice. That's the voice he ventriloquized. He doesn't really think that's the way it was, right? But he thinks that that was the image that, that he was taking up. And, and he's going to try to think about why one could have that image, and he has a theory about it. In fact, a very complicated theory, of which there are two parts, I'll come to. And nonetheless, even with support, it's false. But the idea behind it is that this is a simple truth that will fall apart. Uh, and, but the simple truth itself presupposes, if you wish, some form of functional, structural equilibrium 
it's a model of, so it's as if Talcott Parsons, that he could have invented a perfectly functional society, where each of the bits perfectly was functional for all the other bits, he would have imagined ancient Greeks. That's the idea. And then Greek tragedy uh, is going to be uh, from the get-go, and it's, and it's one of the mysteries about the uh, German understanding of, of ancient Greece is beautiful, uh, is that they read Greek tragedies and they knew that the Greeks didn't think that. <laughs> right? So, it, it, you know, it all kind of hinges on Winkelmann looking at sculptures. I don't know how it got going, but it has something deep to do with Winkelmann. Uh, and the way in which he then influenced the, the take-up. Okay. Well, Greek tragedy, in, uh, particularly in Aeschylus and Sophocles, emerges, in fact, at a moment of crisis in Greek society. It emerges at that moment of transition between two competing social forms, but at a moment in which those two competing social forms coexisted and interpenetrated with one another, that they had reached a kind of equilibrium of a kind, or at least a working compromise. The older social form is that of a society based essentially on the family or the tribe, but a primitive social unit uh, in which uh, the organizational forms were religious in character and that in this ancient uh, or older social form the structure of of property rights and the structure of, of how things got distributed worked through natural lineal descent. Right? Uh, in, oh gosh, in, in sociology, anthropology, kinship systems, you can either follow, everything you either can follow mom or follow dad. Uh, following mom is called matrilineal descent, following dad is called patrilineal descent. And needless to say, the transition from one to the other has a bit of contest about it. We know that, and this should help answer some of the questions about the brother-sister thing, um, that matrilineal descent uh, is uh, based on the idea of the mother's line and on female procreative power. The brother-sister relationship is basic here, the word for brother in ancient Greek is Adelphos, for sister Adelphe. Both of them are derivatives of the Greek Delphos from the word womb. That is, they shared a womb. Right? They are connected in that way. The uh, it hence is natural, because these were matrilineal descents, that in this older setup, and as it then comes to play a role in this moment of crisis, uh, the role of women is to be spokesmen of the divine, of the old religion, and to play out its obligations in the family. The new form, and yeah, just the new form, of course, is the polis or the nation, a collection of families. And the particular representative now is going to be the male citizen. And as Hegel puts it, the notion of political organization was so rudimentary that they hadn't yet figured out bad modes of inequality and hierarchy so they figured out, so they just had democracy as it were as a spontaneous why not right we're all heads of our family we're all you know 
It just like it took time before they realized that there could be much nastier ways of organizing a political world, all of which the Romans managed by themselves. Right? They didn't leave any behind. <coughs> Uh, and just when you're reading, uh, the interesting thing is uh, Aeschylus is the most sensitive to the, the debate. Uh, but he, I read Aeschylus as a defender of the city against the older religion. Conversely, Sophocles, who's a slightly later writer, is more suppressed about it, but it's all over Sophocles, above all in Antigone. And when you read Sophocles, you have to remember he is for his age, a neoconservative, right? He is defending the old religion. Right? Um, he's the Jerry Falwell of, of, of tragedians. Um, well, you miss some of the... <laughs> you get wrong some of the emphases in Sophocles if you don't see what he's up to as a kind of religious reactionary. Okay. The whole and I want to underline this because it's going to come back and haunt us, but it's obvious already, and that's why I wanted to set it up this way, matrilineal descent, patrilineal descent, the entire structure of this society between now the older religious setup and the new political setup is nonetheless structured along a sexual division of labor. So the sexual, so that a natural distinction between men and women is used as a ordering device in order to set up the actual um, mechanisms of social relations between family and state. In paragraph 448, Hegel says remarkably little about the nation. Um, he says, but what he does say is important for us, he says it is uh, in the form of universality. It is, and this matters, I guess, to Hegel, it is the known law and hence based on prevailing custom and in the form of individuality it is the actual certainty of itself in the individual as such and the certainty of itself as a simple individuality is that spirit as governed. So the thought is it's individuals uh, are individual citizens and their individuality gets recognized through their participation in government. Each with an equal voice and all that. In his lectures on the philosophy of history, Hegel says that the Greeks occupy the middle ground of beauty, roughly between symbolic beauty and modern romantic beauty. Uh, in his <clears throat> I can't go through the whole thing, but in his aesthetics, there are three ages of art. The symbolic the classical and the romantic. And this really goes to the ancient Eastern religions. Classical is the Greek, <coughs> you know, the Romans. And by romantic, he means Christian and post Christian art. As we know, for Christianity means for Hegel finally Lutheranism, which ultimately means modernity. Mm -hmm. 
the reason I mention this is because however high the classical and Hegel is some sort of classicist as an aesthetician however high it is it is a moment which has not yet attained the standpoint of truth and the reason it has not done so is because Greeks performed justice according to custom and habit and they do not yet possess a conception of subjectivity. So Hegel, and now I'm quoting Hegel, that these forms of custom habit is the sala element, blah, blah, uh, does not yet include reflection or the subjectivity of the will, the enemies of immediateness. Subjectivity, freedom of the will, reflection are enemies of immediateness. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. The public interest can therefore be entrusted to the will and decisions of the citizens. The Greek constitution must be democratic, for no principle yet exists which might oppose the ethical will or prevent its realization. There aren't any classes yet, for example. The citizens are not yet aware of the particular or therefore of evil, I think the first hint of evil in Greek literature, or something we can recognize as evil, is probably, and I guess maybe in Euripides, maybe, if anywhere, if there, right? But they don't really have that concept, and we'll see it's an important idea for Hegel. Among them, objective will has not yet been shattered. The goddess Athena is Athens itself. That is the real and concrete spirit of citizens. But divinity ceases to reside among the citizens when the will withdraws into itself, into its inaccessible refuge of knowledge and consciousness, and establishes the infinite separation between the subjective and the object. The Greeks know nothing of what we think of or call subjectivity or inwardness. And because of this, it's this that allows a spontaneous democracy. And it's this that therefore permits the thought that one can identify oneself fully and unproblematically with the ethical totality. <laughs> the point is, there's nothing for you not to identify with because there is no you apart from your role in society. So because there's no inwardness, there's no subjectivity, there's no individual having an interest apart from the collective interest, then there is nowhere further for nothing to block that sense that one's entire self is expressed in one's fulfilling of one's social duties. So the difference between social duties and individual duties does not yet exist. Hegel does have 
a lot to say. I'm going to come back to this argument uh, in a moment, but let me just say a bit more about the structure. Hegel does have a lot to say about the family. And he asks the question, what is the family for? And he then goes on to rehearse a whole bunch of possible answers which he thinks are inadequate. So you might think that the essence of the family is love. But that doesn't quite work because the family is an institution, but it's an institution that must have as its end some notion of individuality, that is, the realization of the self, and therefore the notion of love may be a condition of the family, but it's not what the family is for. The family is constituted by many determinations that appear in it. And therefore, and love can't accommodate all of that. It can't accommodate all the various things that the family as a universal institution needs to do. Or to put it another way, the notion of love is the notion of a feeling, and the notion of a feeling can't get the notion of universality necessary for the family as an institution. Well, it might be argued that the family is for the sake of reproducing economic life, but that turns out to be an illusion. Each family can only reproduce itself in a system of economic production that is wider than it. Indeed, that's part of what generates cities in the first place, that the idea of self-sufficient families as economic units broke down. Maybe the purpose of the family is for the education of children. Well, that will not work either because male citizens are educated to become citizens and that would mean that the family was not an equal structural moment but really just a means to the ends of government. So if the thought is that the family is representing having its own weight and, and, and gravitas, it can't be a mere means to an end beyond itself. Hegel says something surprising and extraordinary. He says the real job of the family is to take care of the dead. It has as its object of protein and content this particular individual who belongs to the family, but is taken as a universal being, free from his sensuous i.e. individual reality. The deed no longer concerns the living, but the dead, the individual who, after a long succession of separate, disconnected experiences, concentrates himself into a single, completed shape and has raised himself out of the unrest of the accidents of life into the calm of simple universality. <clears throat> Sorry, where are you quoting from? Uh, is that for... Hmm? Or 451, thank you. In my case, it's from my manuscript. (coughs) 
I take it that there are only there's a, you know, there's a great game in anthropology. Are there any persistent cross-cultural universities? <laughs> Transhistorical, cross-cultural, you know, all of that. Well, I think there are two. I think all societies tell stories and all have rituals concerning the dead. Stories are, of course, about generationality, and so is the dead. That is, societies have to, in order to be a society, you've just got to figure out the relationship, your relationship to your immediate past. You have to have a way of inheriting the past, and therefore you have to have some relationship to your past, which is to say, to your dead. Our humanity is in some sense constituted by our relationship to the dead. The problem is what happens to someone once they are dead? Are they to become, I quote Hegel, an unreal, impotent shadow just because they are dead? Do they retreat immediately back into nature? But if they retreat immediately back into nature, then what does their life mean or has it meant? Is life just an interruption in nature which is itself nothing but a world of the dead. All death is finally natural death. Because being dead is a natural state. If the ray range of questions I just asked are to reverberate and in some sense we can only make human life in general intelligible if when if we can conceive of individuals as being more than parts of nature as such. That is, we seem to be required to sustain, and it sustains the crux here, the excess of culture beyond nature. So the problem of the day this is the problem of the relationship between culture and nature. It's the problem of the autonomy or the relative autonomy of culture. But that relative autonomy is really very, very relative. People die. That's how you know it's that relative, right? But but the fact is we have to, and here's the thought. That is either a mere natural fact in which culture becomes unintelligible to itself, or we have to make the fact of death itself a moment of culture. The other version of this is all that Levi Levy, Levy, Levy Strauss stuff on the raw and the cooked, right? Just the same problem. You need the stuff of the cooked, not because you can't eat raw food, but you've got to have some sense that eating in addition is more than a natural activity. Right? Well, so is death and dying. The burial of the dead makes the individual as dead a continuing member of the community. That is, it gathers that individual up in their individuality 
and therefore makes their death, transforms their death from fact to deed. It's as if all of history is just a little Fichtean <laughs> moment of going from fact to deed. Right? We've got to make the, the fact of death into a deed of death. Not dying, but the death itself, by burial, becomes something done. And therefore, more than <coughs> natural fact. Now, this is not to deny our place in nature. On the contrary, it's to acknowledge the limits of culture and, this is the crux of the matter, make the limits of culture belong to culture. Right? That is, you cannot have the limits of culture as wholly external, right? Or you've got a simple, right, absolute duality which, again, renders life unintelligible or meaningless. <coughs> so we acknowledge the limits of culture and make those limits belong to culture as such. Every act of burial is a fortiori, an act by which the dead becomes, in some sense, an immortal member of society. So the belief in immortality, I want to say, is in some sense a necessary belief. You cannot not believe in the immortality of the dead, otherwise you have no account of death. You just have an account of life and dust. Not death. Of course, you can you can misunderstand the meaning of that, right? We call that misunderstanding Christianity, right? But but it's trying to think something serious. It's not, and the reason you know, it has nothing to do, nothing, absolutely nothing to do with, as it were, just rewards beyond the world, or, you know, solace because life is hell and I'm going to live. That's not thinking about immortality. That's thinking about a better life. Right? Thinking about immortality is thinking about death. Only the dead can be immortal. And only if you're really dead can you be immortal. The Pope never invites me to dinner. Never. I don't know why. Um, so, so every act of burial is uh, one in which the dead becomes an immortal member of society, and therefore the act through which society acknowledges its fundamental and irrevocable dependence on what is no longer living. It is a condition, it is the condition for the comprehension of the acknowledgement of the dependency of culture on nature, which is to say, on the past. All this is finally to say that we have the world we do only through our dead ancestors. And this raises a kind of aporia because the dead, in one way, are never dead enough. 
They weigh on us. They burden us. They, they never go away. On the other hand, they are always absolutely dead. Really dead. What do we owe the dead? Oh, my friend Gregor Harwood says, just the same as we owe the living. We owe them respect, acknowledgement, etc., etc. Okay. This is the heart of the structural setup, which is trying to think through the family. Yeah. Yeah, please. I mean, I'm, I'm making a big theory about. Because I'm curious to hear what you're going to say in response. But mm-hmm. this idea that we need the dead, and um, I sort of want to understand better in what way. I mean, as far as I understand, the crux of the matter is have you turned back to the deed, right. as you said. So really, what's at stake is action. Yep. And um, and so for that, I mean, if you're looking at taking these or instance, what she needs in order to act kind of a literal banal sentence in terms of the prompt that the structure as a corpse. Right. So, um, uh, now why, we want, if, are you saying that there's something more to the dead that we need other than the fact of their body that remains in its figure recognizability as her brother that they're departed by vultures and so forth? Um, or do we need all these other things that you just hinted at um, recognition, respect, veneration, memory, they weigh on us, all these other things. That, that I'm not sure I get immediately. Why do we need that in order to turn no, back no, to the no, no, we don't need that, but that's um, the minimum necessary condition is we need the body and we need to bury it. We need, body, we need, we need to make fact into D. Why do we make need to make fact into D? It's all that other stuff. So that other stuff is not... Isn't only just an effect of that? I mean, in other words, isn't the centrality of the deed from understanding mm-hmm. what generates these other effects? That they wouldn't oh, yes. us if the way that they do. Absolutely, without the deed. No, no, no. The deed is what brings them into... into so, no, so the necessity is the necessity of making the fact of death into a deed. Because we must do that we get all the other stuff. But in getting the other stuff, we recognize, this is typical again, the meaning of the original necessity. Right? So it's, that's the way the loop works. There's an original necessity that then works itself out. Um, and, and of course, I mean, just to say the obvious here, right? uh, this is a book that's going to say retrospection is necessary, right? This is a book about burying the dead, right? You may say the whole phenomenology is a claim that philosophy has forgotten to bury the dead. And therefore it's never been alive. It's always been a bit of a dead thing because it's thought of itself as cut off from its own spiritual conditions of possibility. I mean, isn't, isn't, the, isn't the basic anxiety, though, before I, mean, I understand about retrospectively how those other problems get generated, but isn't the mm-hmm. basic anxiety, I regard this corpse and I want to know that I'm more than simply that. Oh, absolutely. That I'm not just, as you were saying, just to dust, decomposing corpse, worms will eat me, all that. Right. right. In other, well, that's, yes, right. I mean, that has to be, it be in, well, that's why I say you owe it the same as the living, right? Because you might say, Leave them there. Oh, he's died. Oh, the birds come down. This, hold it. Why suddenly, just because they stop breathing, is all that okay? Right? Um, well, you can say, well, that's because they're now bits of nature. Oh, and what does that mean? Right? You, know, you can just uh, see how the problem's going to get going. We cannot make sense of caring about life unless we can make sense of death. Absolutely. In this way. In this way, right? This has nothing to do with Heideggerian being towards death, right? right? This just takes the fact of death as natural. That's its important fact. To think of it as something else 
is, is fantasy land, right? That's part of, you know, Heidegger's heroic stuff. <coughs> this is the deep thing. Because it's not mine. It's about what I inherit. My death is always easy. It's the other's death that's killing. Could I, yeah. Any other, before I press on, so, I mean, this, this matters to the, to the economy of this text. Because what we call, I mean, we have these burial rites. But we have, you know, a language with it. So we call it grief and mourning. Right? Um, and grief and mourning, which is, is you know, and taking these problem. Um, yeah? Uh, just uh, because uh, uh, in the end you mentioned that my test is uh, easy. And uh, you mean, and also it's actually exactly the test of others and <coughs> my test. Because you know, also the death of others, that's always the past. The mind is, that's the future, right. and also then I just so uh, yeah I don't know whether you can explain something. I think that's uh, also Heidegger's death is rather means mind death, and it's also actually in Antigone we can see that the other because Antigone when he did a such burial he actually he is uh, she is facing her own death. She knows that she is facing death. So actually, there's a mind that's also in this part, and it's not in the course. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not... In fact, it, that's not whatever gives her a moment of consideration. One would feel much easier about Antigone if, if, if she was a bit worried and a bit of self-interest. She says, oh, if I do this, you know, I'm going to die. But no, no, she doesn't matter at all. Um, and indeed, as I said, Lacan kind of goes the other direction and says, you know, she's death driven. She's going to find a way to die no matter what, right? <laughs> this is a girl headlong. Um, so, no, what I mean by that is, is I think of the issue of you know facing death the way I <coughs> talks about it as something that happens when you're 16 years old. No, no, I mean this it's a serious thing when you're 16 years old because what you're actually thinking about is how you separate from your family, right? The reason why every 16 year old is a suicide is, is because every 16 year old has to imagine their life apart from their place in their family. So, of course, they become obsessed with their death, right? And, and that, that's necessary as part of this, of taking responsibility for one's own life. Right? But then one realizes that one's own life is not one's own life, it's the life one shares with others, and it's your care for them, and so on and so forth, right? So I just think Heidegger got caught in an adolescent moment and just couldn't get out. He didn't imagine a way out. And I can give an account of why I think that's something to do with what happened to Germany because of the defeat in World War I and the settlement and all that. That there was a strangled... Uh, Germany wasn't allowed to become an adult. Right? That, that was like, the settlement after World War I. Infantilized, and that's what, you know, as I understand that generation, could not bear. So I think there's a a reason why Heidegger had those theories, but I don't think of, of certainly when you get to my age, you know, my dad, worry about my kid, yeah. everyone else's. That's a romantic moment. Hegel is no romantic. Okay, good. Um, so, again, Hegel says, just very briefly, I won't read the whole passage, but 452, this universality which the individual as such attains is pure being, death. It is a state which has been reached immediately in the course of nature, not the result of an action consciously done, blah, 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 blah. 
So it's all about the relationship between fact and deed. Now, the beautiful harmony of Greece, so that the family had a, a role, an inalienable role, that is, apart from the whole business of matrilineal descent, it was the bearer of individuality. And the bearer of individuality in relationship, as we'll see, to the whole of an individual's life, which the state cares nothing about. I'll come to the why not the moon. The beautiful harmony of Greece comes to an end with action. When somebody does something, Creon says that we have to honor the dead. The enemy is nothing to us. To allow them to bury their dead would be to presume that they deserve the same honor as our citizens. I'm quoting from the text. You must remember, it's often forgotten, that Polynices was a rebel that he was attacking thieves, right? And it was a family quarrel, right? He wanted to inherit. Uh, Polynices was not a good guy. And you don't get the free song of the text if you consider him neutral or a good guy. Part of the weight of the text is the assumption, right, seven against thieves, that Polynices is a bad guy, in fact. And therefore, that Crayon had good reasons for not wanting him honored in the same way as he was going to honor those who had died for the sake of saving the city from rebels and renegades who wanted nothing but their, what, private self-interest. So he's not to be buried. Antigone immediately decides to bury her brother, And initially, she does so in secret. She gets caught, and she is not willing to back down. Hence, the law of the nation and the law of the family come into conflict with one another. They come into absolute conflict, and the tragic action foretells the collapse of this whole structure. So, what Hegel wants to think about, you have to be clear about what the stakes are here, he wants to understand, so it's clear we have a structural setup and a vision of a harmonious whole, and that at a certain moment, these two things that have previously been in equilibrium and harmony come into absolute conflict. Right? For Hegel, for Hegel, not for Sophocles, for Hegel, he wants to say, and the whole analysis depends upon this, that this conflict was inevitable. That there is a deep underlying structural flaw in this setup and Antigone's action brings to light this structural flaw and therefore what she does the problem she reveals cannot in principle be resolved in the Greek world that is her action blows the whistle on Greek ethical life, shows where its hollowness is, and therefore foretells its eventual collapse. Clearly doesn't bring it about. Bad politics brought it about. Going to wage wars in Sicily, places like that. Crazy stuff which Euripides kept telling them not to do, by the way. Okay, so what we have to do is track down, and 
I'm, I'm holding, I'm withholding here because I want to get to the right level of analysis rather than, than, than rumors about how this all works. We have eventually have to track down where this structural flaw is. Well, what is it? Yeah. One more question on this point. Mm -hmm. Which is the relationship between the inevitability of this collapse right. and our deed. Right. Which um, um, I can understand her deed as being the occasion, as it were, that brings the structural flaw to the to light, to the surface. That's right. That's what he says. Um, uh, so that, that much I understand. But to but to make it inevitable, maybe I, maybe I misread it, but to make it inevitable would seem in some way to devalue just how necessary the occasion of action is, such that it, it would have happened regardless, which I'm not sure is... Right. No, 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 the, the, the uh, um, as we know, or we should know from the Marx, right, capital has insuperable structural contradictions. It doesn't mean it's ever going to collapse or go away. You can do a, you know, I mean, think about bad marriages. You can figure out ways of patching up, going <coughs> on, saying things with bad society. <coughs> The fact that a structural contradiction is revealed does not necessitate empirical collapse. That's conflating two different levels of analysis. Right? People think because you know capitalism has collapsed, Marx is wrong. <laughs> That's just nuts. It's a misunderstanding of what it is to give an analysis of the internal contradictions of a <coughs> practice. So, so what did you mean by inevitability? That was my question. I mean, I can see that the structural flaw that was from the start, but what was inevitable? What was inevitable was that this harmony would break into disharmony. Right? Not that the whole thing would go away, but that in the same way that there would be crises, <coughs> in another way. Um, crises can be patched up, but they are inevitable because there is a flaw. There's a problem that will always lead to conflict. Conflict does not necessarily generate collapse. That's why I said the conflict is inevitable and necessary, not the collapse. The mutual destruction of all the characters, of course, is the work of fate. Fate refers to the rationality of the whole, the logic of the whole through which lives become fate. Fate is what happens in actuality because of the inadequacy of the rationality of the whole. Once the deed is done, a passionate deed, it reveals a structural conflict, a diremption in the whole, which makes one part of the whole alien, or each part becomes alien to the other. Yet, if each is dependent on the other, that's what I've tried to show, a mutual dependency, <laughs> then in the deed you have alienated a part of yourself. If each of the parts is dependent on its place in the whole, then when that deed comes about, and each part becomes alien from the other part, it's not as if you have an external conflict. You have become alien to yourself. So, in the deed, you separate yourself from something which you are nonetheless intrinsically a part of. 
Hegel thinks this operates for us just as much as it operated for Antigone. The transgressive actions are acts of both alienating yourself from a totality of which you are a part and therefore always acts of self-alienation. Maybe here's a moment to have a quick break. And then I'll see if I can follow through on the song. Both here and elsewhere, Hegel seems to defend war. War makes explicit what is implicit in every state structure. Namely, that the life of the polis is built on the death of its citizens. How come? For Hegel, the state is literally built on the sacrifice of the individual to the whole that is the nation. Think of the problem this way. We are all spontaneously narcissistic creatures. We are all spontaneously self-interested. And everyday life seems to require this. And therefore, everyday life is necessarily forgetful that the possibility of everyday life has its ground in the state. That is, what allows me to cross the street is that there are red lights. What allows me to walk the streets is that there are police and laws. What allows me to get up in the morning and make coffee is that there's electricity and so forth. We are always immersed in our private, self-seeking lives on these deep structures uh, and the laws that regulate them. We are always dependent on the whole and nothing is more human and indeed even necessary, I would argue, than to forget that fact. Can't live in constant acknowledgement of it. War comes as a way of regenerating our communal solidarity. War is a way of reminding us that we are members of a whole and that we are dependent on that whole for our life and that as citizens we are operating in a sacrificial mode. The sacrifice of the particular to the universal. Because it's the universal is the system of structures and practices And it's that which must continue. And at that level, at that level, as I argued last week, the individual is just a thing, right? Not not a doesn't have the moment of their private self interest. Antigone's deed reveals that the ultimate concern of the state is for itself. That every state has both a necessary and a terrible moment of its interest of itself 
as a whole beyond the life of any particular citizens. And it must have that if it's to be a state that fulfills all those roles. Conversely, the ultimate concern of the family is for the life of the individual. So the family exists for exactly taking account of the individual in their individuality beyond their role as being a bearer of a role within a state totality. Antigone's action is about the destruction of the false unity represented by this structure. The reason seems clearly enough that Antigone is not recognized as a citizen because of the sexual division of labor. But if she's not recognized as an individual, then in fact, no individual in this world ever fully appears as an individual. So what makes Greek ethical life what it is, is that in it, individuals have no subjectivity, no interest of their own, no individuality, no singularity. In this world, the world of the Greeks, we understand individuals through the roles they carry out. The role is the source and ground of one's self-understanding. The distinction between the modern and the pre-modern depends on the thought that in the classical world, individuals are only finally bearers of roles. And this is central to Hegel's analysis. Neither Antigone nor Creon act from personal motivation. Neither Antigone nor Creon act from conscience. Nor do Antigone or Creon reflect on what they ought to do. As many tries to get Antigone to reflect, <laughs> but Antigone thinks that the thought of reflection would be a blockage between her and her role. Right? Now, of course, she's both right and wrong. Because as many says, look, look, there's another role you have, namely as a member of the Greek polis. So the relationship between Antigone and Ismene plays out that sense that the two sides are interpenetrate and to alienate yourself from one side is to undergo self-alienation. So you need both Antigone and Ismene to see that, to see that any action, both action and inaction, turns out to be self-alienation under these circumstances. So, for Hegel, the determination of 
Crayon and Antigone's actions is simply a determination given by their role. Paragraph 465, Hegel says, and I don't know until I get there what he says. <laughs> The ground from which this movement starts and on which it takes place is the ethical realm. What is active in this movement, however, is self-consciousness. Qua ethical consciousness, it is the simple, pure direction of activity towards the essentiality of ethical life. That is duty. That is, action is exactly what Bradley thinks it should be all the time, my station and its duty. That famous essay in Eisberg. He thought he was going to bring back ethicality. Misunderstanding Hegel completely. Right? Hegel's actually arguing against that. But it is what he thinks goes on in the Greek world. Consequently, and just to rub this in, a couple of sentences down, we are not faced with the, and this is, this is an irony here, the sorry spectacle. He's trying to say, do not try to make either Creon or Antigone into modern subjects. Do not misread them as moderns, as, for example, Herdlin was in part tempted to do. Consequently, we are not faced with the sorry spectacle of a collision between passion and duty nor with the comic spectacle of a collision between duty and duty, a collision which, as regards its content, is the same as that between passion and duty. These actions are understood as spontaneous. For Antigone... Creon is just a tyrant. For Creon, Antigone is the feminine who is indifferent to the universality of the state. Stated like that, there can be no reconciliation between these two sides. In ethical terms, they are both guilty and they both suffer their guilt. Their blindness to their position within the whole means that they both must suffer. The deed achieves the work of directing the whole and showing its internal decision. So, one thing that Hegel is telling us now <coughs> is one of the reasons why the Greek world appears beautiful. Remember, it's not beautiful, but it appears beautiful, is because of the difference between immediacy of my station and its duty and our culture, which he calls a culture of reflection. Reflexion culture? More or less? Yeah, more or less. Okay. Um, what, what's the difference here? When I have to figure out what to do, I have to step back from the world and reflect. I have to think about what I want, what the moral consequences of my actions are, who is involved in them, who do I need to take account of, who not, what the laws are. In short, the conditions of action for us <coughs> are conditions of wild mediation that we are always already in that sense, alienated from the world of which we are nonetheless 
apart. And we must be. And I'm going to say it's a good thing. That this is a level of alienation that Hegel wants to embrace. Conversely, the Greeks appear beautiful because their relationship to their reality is unreflected. It is immediate. And it comes out as you do what your station requires. We'll find the other condition for beauty uh, in a moment. Well, the objections to this analysis, and I want to use the objection as a way of motivating a deeper understanding of what the analysis is, are legion. Nearly everyone thinks that Hegel got it wrong. Uh, and, and they thought so from the get-go, right? Um, everyone just thought he was making mistakes. So, Goethe argues that this play is not a play about city and family. It is not about the collapse of the whole, but it is a celebration of Greek classicism. That's that's the one that always finds, for me, just puzzling. Goethe being willfully classicist. I have no idea. No idea. He does say correctly that Antigone never admits guilt. Antigone, he says, is the heroine and Creon, the bad guy. And indeed, it is clear, I think, that Sophocles meant the play to be a defense of Antigone against Creon. Sophocles, as I mentioned earlier, meant it as a defense of tradition. He meant it as a defense of the old gods versus the new gods. Nonetheless, just, just, and I'll say more about this shortly, but I was just rereading last night A.C. Bradley's beautiful essay on, on Hegel and tragedy. And he says, nonetheless, this play would not be a tragedy unless there was a fundamental conflict. And and there can only be a fundamental conflict if both sides have a moment of rightness about them. That is, what makes it tragic. Otherwise, it's just uh, a story about our doubting heroine going up against a miserable state apparatus, and therefore it's a very sad play. It's not a tragedy. It's just bad news. What makes it tragic is that even she must feel the pull of the alternative side, even though she thinks it's wrong. So if even she feels Then, and this is the point of Hegel's analysis, then the question of who is the hero and who's the bad guy is at the wrong level of analysis. Patricia Mills, uh, in an early article that really pulled together, I think, significantly... um, a really excellent essay uh, pulls together most uh, writing from a kind of Marxist feminist position uh, launched a whole series of criticisms of which there are four essential ones. The first, according to her, read what she says the first is that Hegel completely disregards she says the sister sister relationship in his search 
for the ideal relationship as a male-female relationship <coughs> of identity indifference. Now, it is perfectly true that this is driven by, and this, of course, is what Derrida harps on about, and everyone harps on about, there is some, as it were, something about the brother-sister relationship that seems special. I want to say that like everything else, everything else I think that's peculiar in Hegel is in the play. That the reason that he harps on on the brother-sister is because Antigone does. She says, oh, you know... Lovers, parents, you know, children, but the brother is irreplaceable. That's her argument, not Hegel's. The reason Hegel thinks it's important is because he recognizes it's an exemplification of natural legal descent. And therefore, it's important because it is not about the relationship between brother and sister, but about the role of the feminine, which I'm going to argue is his point, and not an argument against him, that he's obsessed with the problem of the sexual division of labor. Secondly, Mills argues that Antigone, in acting, enters the polis, and that Hegel seems to ignore this. What Hegel seems to forget is that in order for Antigone to be a civil disobedient, and that's how she is portrayed as a civil disobedient, as a lawbreaker on the basis of principle, of a higher law that the state needs to recognize. So she is, for Hegel has, I should let you know, because if we're thinking about, Hegel's three great heroes are all civil disobedience. They are Antigone, Jesus, and Socrates. Now that all three of them are fundamentally civil disobedience should be interesting to us about Hegel's interest in them and what he thinks about action. The claim is, is that he, he forgets that in order to do that she must leave the family and enter the polis. And indeed she does. She enters into direct argument with Creon. But then, why does Hegel claim this is a structural conflict between the family and the polis? <coughs> Antigone, Mills wants to say, is a political being, and Hegel does not fully appreciate this. I would have thought the argument is exactly the other way around. that she both was and was not a political being is the point of the entire analysis. It's Creon who refuses to recognize her as having a voice worth hearing in the political world while simultaneously even the citizens, namely the chorus, are saying, well, 
Creon, really, the girl has a point. That is, they were already trying to lever her up out of the family into the polis. But exactly how was that supposed to happen? Hegel's thesis is there simply was no structural space so that she is political and she fails to be political is exactly the tension he's trying to analyze, not bury it, right? Of course, you can celebrate her as a political being, but that would miss the tragedy again, right? Then you would have already solved the problem. There's a problem because she cannot be the political being she must be. Otherwise, again, there's no tragedy. Thirdly, Mill says that Antigone is not guilty, but Hegel makes her guilty. Why is Hegel so adamant about the equality of guilt? I've already given a partial answer to that, and I'll come back to it. Fourth, Hegel is presupposing the position of Creon that is, he's presupposing the truth of the universal. From the point of view of the universal, there is a suppression of women. It is nature, Mills argues, that finally gets suppressed, and culture, the polis, triumphs. Therefore, a woman, she argues, is left outside of history and outside of society. In Hegel, Woman is the other, and being the other, she is defined by the universal and cannot define herself. The externality of the women here is defined by male universality. The truly feminine, Mills wants to argue, in an irrigarian sort of way, although Mills really hadn't, irrigari hadn't really percolated here, but Mills got there anyway. The truly feminine is the other of the masculine defined woman as the other, that is, she is the other of the other. Well, Antigone. never does acknowledge any guilt, and Hegel does not explain her power of intervening. Hegel does not explain what power enables Antigone to appear on the public stage. Antigone does not speak with a universal voice, And as I'll say in the moment, she necessarily speaks in a variety of voices, none of which she can fully own. Irigarai's complaint about Hegel, I just want to get them all, all out there, it's no fun otherwise. Let me explain why I'm saying what I'm saying. My claim is going to be to anticipate um, that the arguments against Hegel make the argument of the chapter unintelligible. That is, if Hegel's critics are right, then this chapter cannot play the role Hegel is trying to make it play in the economy of the whole. So my suggestion is going to be not only are these criticisms false, but they are in principle logically incompatible with the text. Otherwise the text cannot be 
an argument on its own. And the reason why this happens, and I should be clear here, is that every single one of these critics read this section in isolation. They look at it on its own as representing Hegel's view of the Greek world and his interpretation of Antigone, and not as a moment in the unfolding of spirit. Not one of these critics, not a one, even the best of them, the best of them is easily Butler, not one of them mentions Rome. Yet Rome is actually part of the same chapter. right? It's a three-part chapter, the ethical order, the deed, Roman legal status. That's the structure of the chapter. Okay, so that's what I'm going to argue. But before doing so, I need to make sure that I'm fair to the critics, I want the positions to be out there. So Irigari, of course, takes the famous passage about woman as the eternal irony of community. So, while the story is a story of the triumph of human law, Is this story the story of the triumph of human law? Almost all the feminist critics say this. I see not one drop of evidence for it. Let that one go. So while the story is a triumph of human law, Hegel recognizes woman's permanent disruption. The divine law, Irigarai says, is the law of earth and blood. So, by their nature, women unsettle the standard rule of reason of the same and the other. Again, because she is the other to the other, she is defined as being by male reason and law. The other of the other is not simply woman, but what does not fit into any neat determined ontology, namely fluidity, movement, holes, slime, and the like. Butler, in her book, also underlines that Antigone never acknowledges her guilt, nor does Hegel explain Antigone's power of intervening. Above all, it is Butler who underlines that Antigone does not have a univocal voice. And she does so by reminding us who Antigone is. She is not only Polynices' sister, she is also his aunt. She is both the sister and daughter of Oedipus. She speaks when she speaks against Creon as a man and unmans her uncle. It's what he complains about. He says, you know, do not unman me, Haman, do not be unmanned by that woman. I'll come back to those passages later. She is betrothed, in fact, to her cousin, Haman. So she is a scandalous, performative disruption and perversion of the symbolic and social order. She is, as it were, the living movement of the failure of the incest heaven. And therefore she is the less than human and it's the less than human Butler says that speaks as human. For Butler Irigari is simply an essentialist and her account of radical otherness in terms of ethics of sexual difference is actually misses out on the actual complexity that is acted out by Antigone. 
Well, all these analyses, clearly we're not going to finish today, many of these analyses look at, of course, one significant passage, namely the endlessly long paragraph 475, Let me have to say a word about paragraph 475 and I'll wrap up there and I'll carry on next week. Um, it is in this paragraph, and I want to do this because I want to give a hint about how I want to do this reading. Top of page 288. Since the community only gets an existence through the interference <coughs> since the community only gets an <coughs> existence through its interference with the happiness of the family and by dissolving individual self-consciousness into the universal dissolving it into the state it creates for itself in what it suppresses and what is at the same time essential to it an internal enemy womankind in general <coughs> before I read the next sentence notice what has just been stated it creates for itself in what it suppresses and what is at the same time an internal enemy womankind in general womankind the everlasting irony in the life of the community changes by intrigue the universal end of government into a private end transforms its universal activity into the work of some particular individual and perverts the universal property of the state into a possession and adornment of the family. Woman, in this way, turns to ridicule the earnest wisdom of mature age, which, indifferent to pure, purely private pleasures and enjoyments, as well as to plain and active part, only thinks of and cares for the universal. That's the incriminating passage. About that passage, I want to say two things. And I'll pick them both up next week. The first thing to say is that, again, this is not Hegel's voice. This is the voice of Creon. Indeed, the whole of the movement of the play from around line 650 is exactly about making this claim about the feminine. So he claims, um, if men live decently, it is because discipline saves their very lives for them. So I must guard the men who yield to order and not let myself be beaten by a woman. Better it must happen that a man should overset me. I won't be called weaker than womankind. And then as the argument between he and the chorus and Haman goes on, it appears more and more that the debate is really about Haman taking the woman's role and undermining the goods of the state. So this whole passage 
is the voice of Creon. It's his argument in the play. How do we know it's not Hegel's argument? Well, I think, lo and behold, we can know it from going on and reading the rest of the paragraph. <laughs> that is, it's not a bit of a mystery. The community, a bit further down, however, can only maintain itself by suppressing this spirit of individualism. So womankind represents the spirit of individualism. And because it is an essential moment, all the sign, all the same creates it and moreover creates it by its repressive attitude toward it as a hostile principle. So what Hegel is here arguing is that by its suppression of womankind, it creates something new. The spirit of individualism. And it's going to be the spirit of individualism that has been lacking in the Greek world. And that's what he goes on to say. However, this principle, being merely evil and futile in its separation from the universal end, would be quite ineffectual if the community itself did not recognize the power of youth. The manhood which, while immature, still stands within the sphere of individuality. As the power of the whole, for the community is a nation, is itself an individuality, and essentially is only such for itself by other individualities being for it, etc., etc. So what's emerging here, what Antigone represents, and is going to represent for him, is the emergence of the principle of being not a man or a woman, but being an individual. And it's the spirit of individualism that's going to be called, eventually become subjectivity, that Hegel recognizes as the great achievement of modernity. So it is Antigone who first appears on the stage, and this is the point of the analysis, analysis, by breaking the law of the state, she crashes through the equilibrium of roles, and she becomes the first individual. And by becoming the first, and this is her dislocation. Remember, she is neither in the family nor in the state. Well, she's neither in the family nor in the state. Where is she? She appears as herself, which is why Hegel talks about her in these awe stricken terms the greatest woman to walk the face of the earth. He's struck by her individuality, but it's by dint of this tragic conflict, she is forced into individuality. But it's just that individuality which the Greek state did not know and had no room for and was the cause of the conflict. So rather than, in most tellings of the story, it's Socrates who's the first individual, the first subject of this world. For Hegel, it's Antigone. <coughs> That's why she is a heroine. That she gives rise to the claim of individuality, not by defending the family, but by breaking through role-bound action as such. That is, in fulfilling her role, she goes beyond the idea of role and is forced, she's forced to speak in her own voice. And that, I want to argue, 
by the way. Now that's true of much Greek tragedy. That the women are consistently, because they're sacrificed, because Hecuba's left behind, because all those guys have killed everyone, they're forced to their own voice beyond the role of religion. So the irony here is individual young men are sacrificed to the state and never attain individuality. It's only women who do the job of burying that care about individuality. And that caring about individuality has no role in the Greek world except in death. In the denial of Polynaisi's death, Antigone is forced to make the idea of individuality a claim against the state. Right? Not she makes it in the name of religion, but in making it against the state, she's actually going beyond the structure of religion and state. And I will next week certainly go on to talk about the chapter on culture and all that stuff.